Um, this is, my name is uh, Peter Gagan. This is my talk, um, Why Upstart is Weird, uh, which seems like perhaps a slightly provocative title, but it really wasn't intended to be. Um, I, I think I'm entirely justified in characterizing it as weird. Um, I'm a post-ref major contributor. I tend to work on performance stuff historically, and I work for Heroku. Um, but enough about that. What's this talk about? So um, this concerns uh, upstart, which is um, this notion, a little over defined, of an insert or an update. Uh, so we want is for people to get one or the other as appropriate, um, as defined in terms of a duplicate. In the case of my particular definition of upstart, a would-be violation of a duplicate uh, index. Sorry, a, a unique index, I mean. I'm going to talk a bit about the strate strategic implementations, and mostly I'll be talking about the implementation considerations. Um, is there a bond problem? I'm not aware that there is. I don't. I'm, I might, maybe perhaps if I could project my voice a bit further. Uh, how's that? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think that's pretty self explanatory. Or well, I'll put it anyway. So I would also like to address what the talk is not about. Um, some of the hackers in the room will be aware that there was some uh, robust discussion on LISP about um, some intricate details about how we might go about implementing this. In particular, uh, Heike Nakangas, who was um, a reviewer of uh, some of this work, um, felt I should go a different way, um, which is essentially an open issue, but um, it's kind of irrelevant to the discussion today. And anything I say here would probably as well apply to, to what the, the direction Heike wanted me to go. So we're talking about implementations that are uh, more or less equivalent from a technical point of view, and certainly from the, in terms of the usability semantic. So um, in going about implementing this feature, um, obviously I'm a practical man and I wanted to I wanted to come up something that satisfied everyone um, so hackers you know are aware that this is a strategic feature um, and are I assume aware that we're at something of a disadvantage for not having it that much is clear um, users want something broadly useful um, something that will do to, will accomplish what they want with the minimum of fuss um, there is a lot of misinformation on the internet at large about what works and what doesn't. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot there's a lot of uh, suggestions made on various blogs and so on um, about how you might go about implementing this in an ad hoc sort of way, which are incorrect in that they don't consider various race conditions. So any, anyway, quite obviously, as an implementer, I want to. I want to satisfy everyone here. Um, so this is just a random sampling of um, people uh, grumbling about this on Twitter. Um, take it for what you will. It's not a scientific poll. Uh, perhaps I'm sure you can get cranks complaining about any number of things on Twitter. So this is just a visual metaphor for complaints I hear all the time. Anyway, enough of that. Upstart in theory. What are my goals for upstart in Postgres more in, in particular? Well, my main one is that I want to preserve what I refer to as the fundamental upstart property, which is to say, recommitted isolation level, you always get an atomic insert or update as appropriate. Um, there can be no unprincipled deadlocking, no deadlocking that we as a community can't very well. You know, if someone presents us with a query that's deadlocking, and we can't very well say, well, just don't upstart so much. Um, that doesn't seem like a reasonable answer to me if they're doing something that's perfectly innocent where we can't do that kind of analysis and say, well, we should do some, you know, this mutual dependency, just sort that out. If we can't say that to them, surely that's not going to fly. Um, and also no spurious unique constraint violation, which is pretty much the same thing, um, as far as I'm concerned at least. Um, so in my mind, 
any command we might provide would would not require us to specify the index in the DML statement. There'd be an implicit understood uh, unique index that we'd be merging on, and the user would be required to get those details right. But it's almost always self-evident what they intend to merge on. Um, we don't want to require them to specify a unique index. Um, that would be that would have obvious problems. Um, a further goal is acceptable performance. In particular, we don't want to burn through XIDs excessively quickly. Um, this is thought to be impractical for um, various use cases in particular. Um, use cases around uh, conflict resolution for multi-master replication, which is something I expect to become increasingly important in the years ahead. So those, these are my goals from a high level. Now I'm going to go on to discuss how unique indexes work in Postgres. Within the executor, we handle uh, insertion of a single table slot. In this exec insert function, so it'll be called typically each time for every, if you have a multi-statement, a multi-row insert statement, it'll be called for every row you want to insert. Um, what occurs within this routine is a single heap tuple is inserted, um, which we now have a physical identifier for. And subsequently, subsequent to that, we insert um, the index tuples themselves, which now have a reference to the heap um, that is this table that they can, um, you know, they can sanely use. Um, so, at, at, at present, only the B3 access method is ports unique indexes um, as cataloged by AM can unique equals equals true. Um, so, what happens if, if there's a unique violation? Is the B3 code port transaction and can't proceed, obviously. Um, it might happen on the first unique index. It might happen <laughs> on the second or subsequent one. And um, in theory, it's the AM's problem as to how this occurs. Um, but in practice, there's only that one. So more or less, you can take it that we're talking about B-trees when we're talking about unique indexes in practice. Um, how do the B-trees handle this, though? Um, so with trivial exception, they don't have any visibility information. So thus, it becomes necessary for us to go to the heap in order to get that. It is not evident from just looking at the physical uh, index tuple as to whether or not it ought to be visible to our MVPC snapshot. Um, but when handling um, potential uh, violations, we don't actually care about MVPC semantics anyway. Um, we care about something quite distinct. We want we still have to worry about things that are not yet visible to our transaction, but are conclusively committed. So that's actually what we're, we're looking for there. Um, so this is an abstraction called a dirty snapshot. It's not our existing MVCC snapshot, of course. Um, and these are used for just this kind of thing in um, a number of different places in the code. So we're looking for these conclusively visible duplicates. Um, and we may have to wait, pending the outcome of a real transaction that originally inserted it, if it's um, running concurrently with our own. Um, and as I said, we throw an error if there is one conclusively committed. Um, a little on the B-tree structure here. So we use buffer locks to protect the physical structure of the B-tree. This preserves various invariants. So the emphasis, what I'm emphasizing here is this is, uh, the locking protocol is more or less integral to um, whatever particular B-tree implementation can be used as a data structure, as opposed to serving some um, higher level purpose that makes sense only in the context of a relational database or whatever. Um, so these are pr preserving vari various invariants, if you like. A um, <coughs> little bit on how that works with an index scan. Um, so unique indexes kind of sort of work by treating the uniqueness aspect as just such an invariant. In practice, of course, it's a lot messier than that. And um, we could have multiple versions of tuples in the same B tree corresponding to each heap version. Um, and they don't duplicate each other according to semantics we find useful here. Um, so they could be deleted already or something like that, and, and yet still physically be present. And of course, we have to care about these sorts, sorts of distinctions. Um, so what, ha what occurs in order to, when we're inserting a index tuple into each physical index is that we um, exclusive lock 
um, a leaf page. And subsequent to that, we search the heap for duplicates um, on the first and subsequent leaf pages. Um, and the original exclusive block is held throughout. Some people consider this to be particularly a questionable practice, but that's the way it works. Um, we need an exclusive buffer lock because we can't very well have a shared and then escalate to an exclusive. We need to sort of, um, if you like, um, put a pin in whatever value it is we're considering the uniqueness of whatever value we're actually inserting into the unique index. Um, we must, in a limited sense, lock, say, the integer value 5, a value in the abstract. Um, we cannot lock some existing object because there isn't any, and that's kind of the point. Or the problem, we hope there isn't any, at least. Um, so I have occasionally characterized this as value locking. Um, so in some two-phase locking systems, this is a, something that um, appears much more frequently and is frequently managed by the heavyweight lock manager in such systems. And it's more of a natural kind of a um, concept to people that use both systems. Um, so um, I think that's enough on that. Um, so you know we're, we're we're doing this in order to prevent race conditions. We can't very well allow someone to get in ahead of us, if you like, um, and insert the same value that we are inspecting for uniqueness at, at that time. And we can't very well hold the exclusive buffer lock all day long, or even for more than an instant, just by the nature of buffer locks. Um, that will be unacceptable for numerous reasons. Um, so when we see that there's an inconclusively committed conflict people, um, originating from a transaction hasn't committed or aborted yet, we don't know what's going to happen with that transaction yet, of course. We have to wait and see, potentially all day long. We can't very well hold on to that buffer lock. So having obtained the uh, transaction ID of said other transaction, um, we can, we'll go to sleep on that and wait until it commits, and then we we'll woken up and then we can check again, pretty much from scratch. Um, and then we'll do that until we get a conclusive yes, no answer in respect to the question, is there a would be, is there a would be duplicate in this unique index? So in a sense, we link the um, low level high performance buffer locks, the longer lock manager managed transaction locks in this, in this way. Um, we don't have row locking style lock arbitration. Um, in the V3 code at present. So when this happens, um, there's no guarantee that the first uh, person to wait will be the, um, the first person to get a second chance, if you like. Um, unlike, say, row locking, where that just wouldn't be acceptable. Um, um, this works OK for unique index enforcement. Um, it's, a very, it's a very limited form of value locking, good enough for unique index enforcement. Um, we're going to talk about naive approach to upsert, and this is the early thoughts on how one might kind of go about implementing it. So we, in a sense, tie index value locking to conventional row locking. We don't insert the heap tuple first. We go and value lock all unique indexes to whatever mechanism it might actually be. And um, then having perhaps achieved a consensus, we go and insert. Um, otherwise, we go and update. Um, and then finally, we would release the value locks when we're done with the update or insert, whatever it might be. And then this sort of escalation occurs, and everything works out. Right? Well, no. Uh, <laughs> there are problems with this. Um, and that brings me to upsert in practice. So it's an inter this is a kind of a visual me metaphor, I suppose, for an idea I'm trying to communicate, which is that when you look at upsert, it looks somewhat like this. It's an impossible uh, shape, obviously. Then you sort of look at it up close, you realize it looks more like this, um, which is to say uh, not terribly impressive in many systems as implemented. Um, and I'll have more on that in a little while. Anyway, getting back to the problems I referred to with 
overlapping value in row lock. Um, so if the user locks two things at once, and they're not careful about the ordering, this is a very general statement, they, they may, of course, deadlock. Um, so these are two distinct types of locks, value locks and row locks. And this, as I said, equally applies to any proof of concept implementation that has been produced by anyone to date. Um, so if we don't account for this, we'll tend to see um, consistent deadlocking in a way that just isn't defensible. We can't very well tell our users, well, don't upsert so much, sorry. At least I don't think so. Um, and of course, we have to, still have to worry about regular inserters, even if they're not upserting. Um, and they're only going to be prevented from finishing their inserts, because of course the um, insertion into the indexes occurs last, um, and that's it. Um, and we can't really determine if predicates are valid at a time. Um, this is thought to be quite impractical. Um, it's going to be an empty hard problem. So my conclusion um, is that you cannot tie value locking to row locking. And I'll have the two overlap on the assumption that everything will work out and you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to sort of just get, you know, get, get one lock and then get the other lock and then release them in the opposite order. That just isn't going to work acceptably provided we assume that at least we committed we can't very well just throw an error of any kind. We want what are more or less similar semantics to the crude uh, sort of way we do it at the moment, which is not ideal for a number of reasons, where we have um, basically we insert and then if it doesn't work, we update. Either two of those can, both of the, uh, one of the other those can fail potentially repeatedly, so we have to loop. Um, so we want to provide essentially the same guarantee that that does, which is that um, for you know reasonable cases of releasing recommitted, it really ought to not throw any kind of error. Um, I think that's a, what, what the user expectations in this area are, and I don't know that I, I'm not going to do, I'm, not, I'm suggesting that there aren't other, other cases that are important, um, and those could be covered in a number of different ways, but I think this is, this is the, the most compelling case to cover. I'm going to talk a little about other systems now, and uh, their SQL merge implementation. This is a website I found detailing um, problems with the implementation in SQL Server. Um, it's kind of, this is kind of a messy business when you're, so I mean, you already saw the, uh, the, the visual metaphor I used for how um, upsert works in practice. And I think the way, the, the way it works in practice is they, they, kind of, they kind of cheat. And it's kind, of a, it's kind of a dirty business. So it's sort of necessary to consider the trade-offs that other systems have made. I think it's just the nature of this kind of thing. Um, and in particular, it was generally assumed that SQL merge in other systems would provide the same guarantees I described um, when I first listed my requirements for upsert. Everyone always assumed, I believe, or at least most people, that um, it would do it would do an uh, insert or an update. But in fact, that is not the case, as we'll see. There are issues with other implementations. Duplicate key violation errors for a perfectly simple uh, upsert style SQL merge. It's possible to get um, duplicate key violation errors without um, misusing the feature in any way under concurrency. And so you'll randomly have um, you'll randomly have these transactions throwing errors. Uh, I would suggest that this is unacceptable, at least for the sol solving the basic problem. Um, there are reasons that we might want to do that, but um, that is not my immediate concern. So the author of the blog described that I just saw, that I showed describing these issues, um, describes how this, there's this intent update page lock, um, and the update key, um, uh, and then there's an update key lock as well, um, and it sort of releases the locks prior to doing an insert. Um, these, are, these are somewhat like my value locks. Um, now, one workaround described is to use hints in order to make those value locks persist till the end of their transaction, which makes that issue go away. Presumably, it's not that it's fault because it would cause uh, unprincipled deadlocking, which is another problem you could have. 
Um, so this is this whole business is, is rather uh, rather finicky. Um, all of these outcomes I have considered to be unacceptable for solving a basic problem. So um, there is something to be learned from the mistakes of others, I hope. Anyway, what my proposed patch does here, getting back to talking about how I do value locking. So we have these low-level buffer locks that are already acquired in the process of obtaining a, uh, you know, the process of unique index enforcement. We, as we currently do, we acquire this exclusive lock on a C3 least page. My proposed patch will escalate this to a heavyweight lock um, in respect of each index or inserting into. Um, the goal here is to reach consensus across unique indexes. Now, I said at the start that it wasn't really clear. It's not clear to the implementation what the user means, but it's usually really obvious to the user what they mean. They know what they mean, typically. Um, and there might be edge cases where that isn't true, and those uh, bear considering. But so in the general case, it's self-evident as to what um, index, unique index they expect their uh, violation might be on. So, we, but of course, we don't we don't know that. It's implicit. So we need to reach a consensus across all unique indexes. Um, so my approach is essentially to stagger what is, in fact, the traditional unique index enforcement <coughs> mechanism across multiple unique indexes in an attempt to reach such a consensus. If not, I go to lock the duplicate row opportunistically. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that just like when we're doing a regular unique index insertion, there's no um, the, the lock arbitration rules are ill-defined. So there's, once again, there's no guarantee that the first inserter, or the first waiter is going to be the first one to get a second chance. There is what you might, I suppose, characterize as a race condition. Um, but this is also a property of my implementation. And I would suggest it's an innate property of anything that has the, um, the various trade-offs that I proposed as being the most useful for um, our first run at this thing. So anyway, we go to lock the row opportunistically. There's nothing to say that it'll, having already released the locks, we go to lock the row opportunistically. Um, so the original heavyweight pages are dropped. And we go to update. Otherwise, we risk unprincipled deadlocking, which wouldn't be OK. At least I don't think so. So it's kind of like SQL Server, except there are theoretical lock starvation hazards because we're looping. We're not accepting it if there is um, a failed insert or a failed update, which appears to be what the proprietary implementations of merge do. We all knew that the SQL standard didn't require merge to deal with these um, various cases. But it was always my assumption that, um, up until fairly recently, in fact, that um, that was because the, uh, you know, they didn't want to have to go into details of concurrency models, which they would typically not want to discuss. They would, you know, purposefully leave those aspects well defined. So that's why I thought it was the case that there was no requirement that they didn't have these various conditions. But in fact, it seems like they have. Um, in any case, they completely failed to meet my definition of um, the. They completely failed to have what I what I've called the fundamental upsurge property. Anyway. Yes, there are these lock starvation hazards because we are looping, and there's no um, way we're we're not making useful progress. This is analogous to what occurs today with uh, when we have a, you know we have the the LTGSQL example where we're we're looping. Similarly, there's no um, there's no reason to think that in theory it could it could loop indefinitely, um, although um, it appears to not be an issue in practice. Um, so. This is a this is a trade-off, in essence. So con some conclusions here. So it's kind of confusing that row uh, heap rows, that is rows and tables, 
Um, can, they kind of work like value lock just by virtue of having values if and only if there is a physical index tuple. So it's, it's kind of confusing that you have these uh, heap rows in tables that are in one sense value locks in that you can block on a value level conflict. Um, so I'm keen to make that, that distinction. Um, I think it does, I think it's still a salient distinction when you, you know, regardless of the implementation, as we'll see. Um, so I don't think you can reasonably tie the two unless you start off with a different trade off to the one that I started off with. Um, um, so this has been shown to cause unprintable deadlocks, basically. I think this view has um, one acceptance on hackers. Um, so Heike, um, in response to um, some feedback that I had on his um, sort of sketch, uh, update, updated his um, approach to account for this fact. Um, so it's a little bit um, fuzzy as to whether or not he would call what I'm calling value lock value lock. These are the semantics I personally find to be useful. Um, because you're, you know, the, the important distinction is that you can block something that doesn't exist yet, um, which is of course not the case with these row locks. Um, and of course, these value locks are only useful when you go to insert. Um, they only stop you from finishing. They don't stop you from starting. If you know what I mean. So I'm a little aside on the proposed syntax. Um, this is something that is probably still quite controversial, um, but is negotiable. Um, so um, it looks something like this. Now, uh, <laughs> pardon? Oh, I've, I've got ways. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, the initial motivation for doing things this way was I thought it would be useful for uh, multi-master replication use cases in particular, which were an upfront concern that I had. Andres informs me that um, he feels that a C-level API would be um, just as useful. And so I'm willing to um, certainly willing to revisit the syntax proposed here. Um, but it isn't all, that isn't all that interesting, except perhaps it, that in that it's more flexible than other approaches that we might take. If, for example, we were to use um, MySQL's insert on duplicate key update syntax, it is less flexible than this because you can't delete something instead of updating it and things like that. I don't understand what you mean. I, I guess so, but I'm just, all I'm saying is that in practice, everyone else, when they have something like that, they don't have delete unless it's merged, which that's what I mean. Um, so this is, it's merge-like, but in some ways more flexible, in other ways less. Um, we can actually detect where conflicts occur. I won't go into that in too much detail. Um, so this is, for those that you, of you that perhaps are not so familiar with Postgres, although um, probably not a good talk to be in if you're not. Uh, this is a this is a writable CTE here, so we're inserting into this table to test, if you like, opportunistically. And if there's a duplicate, we're projecting that out using this special reject clause. So this is uh, this is a temporary uh, common table expression. Um, this is referenced in the updates. So when we're projecting the rejects out, we can only update those that are rejected, which will already be locked. Um, so um, that's this is this is sort of like a build your own upsurge thing. Perhaps that wasn't the best idea, but um, there you have it. Um, but this has interesting implications in itself, which would equally well apply to another syntax, I think. Um, I'm going to talk about that now. This is uh, visibility in the logically spun progress conflict kids problem. What does that mean? Well, Robert Haas was, as far as I know, um, the person that initially identified the, the problem. Here he, he speaks about, um, so, go, okay, going back to the syntax here, 
we have to consider that when we go to insert something, there could be a duplicate, but a duplicate that isn't visible to our transaction, or sorry, rather our snapshot, um, because um, it logically occurs later, if you will. We still have to care about that. We still have to do something about it. The question becomes, what? Um, now, Robert suggests, perhaps not entirely seriously, that um, you would have a serialization failure, um, even at recommitted. I don't like that either. Um, that seems like a, another thing that I, people are just not going to be happy about. Um, if you want, if you if you want, re, um, you know, to have serializable isolation level, use serializable isolation level. If you don't, then don't. Um, so, you know, we have to worry about whether or not something we might have to go update isn't even visible to our snapshot yet, which is obviously problematic. Um, so, I'm just, th these are really the points I just made. We need to have the update succeed because if it doesn't see the thing it needs to update, then it's not going to work. The update won't update anything, even though it ought to have, at least within the developer's mental model. That would be quite counterintuitive were that to happen, so we would hope to avoid it. Um, so that's that. So taking a step back for a moment, I'm going to briefly discuss the eval plan qual mechanism. So Postgres has always allowed recommitted isolation level update and delete statements to, if you like, reach into the future rather than have a serialization failure um, when another open or concurrently committed transaction modified the tuple to be updated or deleted. So in a sense, we're already playing tricks where we're reaching into the future in order to avoid having a serialization failure. This is the historic behavior of recommitted. There's actually a huge amount of mechanisms to make this work. It's rather involved um, just for recommitted level. Um, is rerun for each modified tuple. Um, but ultimately, the reason this happens is, have you got a better idea? Um, there's, you know, there's a fundamental tension there. You have to do something, and this is what we do. So to illustrate with a simple recommitted update, um, next scan, we say modify table node here. This is a plain analyzed, very simple update statement. Um, ultimately, exact update. Looks like exec, similar to exec insert, is called by the modified table node. Um, this is where the magic may happen. Um, but there's nothing special about the index scan. Um, it's using an ordinary MVCC snapshot. So we can reach into the future, all right, but we need something to grab in the present to get there, conceptually. And um, we need to see some row version, and that is different to my problem where there's um, potentially no row version. Um, so this is something that has been called an MVCC violation um, in that it's violating an intuitive notion of how MVCC ought to work. And this is something that occurs all the time today with regular updates and, uh, at recommitted level. Anyway, a little bit of background on that. That's a, it's, a very, it's a very complicated mechanism, and I'm not going to go into the details of that too much. Um, So, what does this mean for upsert? So, if we're going to all this trouble to avoid a serialization failure um, and doing something reasonably non surprising instead, then perhaps we can do something similar for um, my problem. Perhaps we can come up with a new MVCC violation, a new way of reaching into the future sufficient to serve the needs of upsert. Um, so the idea here, as implemented, is that um, if you lock a tuple that is logically in the future um, and therefore not visible under conventional MVCC rules, it becomes visible simply by virtue of your having locked it with an upsert, which is kind of strange, I'll grant you. Um, but it's a basically a it's, it's a mechanism for looking in the f into the future um, to the degree necessary to make. Uh, Upsert work. Um, it doesn't really have anything in particular to do with the proposed syntax. 
Um, if you were to pass the kit around internally, you'd still, it would still be more or less equivalent in my view. Um, I know I don't want to, I don't want to presume too much about um, what this means for the implementation, but I'm, I'm trying to give a relatively high level overview of um, the problems as I see them. So, I'm sort of presenting this as a fundamental trade-off. It appears to me that you can have any two of these three you want. Um, you can have some kind of well-defined lock arbitration, or no duplicate errors, or no deadlocks. So I'm proposing that we have no duplicate errors and no, no deadlocks at the expense of a tricky uh, lock arbitration rule. Um, so getting back to spurious duplicate violations in other systems. Simon Riggs here speaking in 2008. Um, Simon, uh, my former uh, employer, uh, we often discuss how we might go about implementing this, so he's, he took a certain amount of interest in it in the years past. Anyway, he describes here um, how it's possible in practice for the proprietary systems to have these duplicate uh, violations with there being no practical way to avoid them except less concurrent merging. Um, this might be surprising to some. So he says here about this can happen with our current ad hoc approach. That's not quite true. It only applies if you don't have a loop, but our example currently does. Um, so it is evident that both uh, SQL Server and Oracle SQL Merge implementation exhibit this behavior, even for trivial upserts that don't um, join tables. They're only joining an inline using on values that are all distinct. So you're, you're doing the simplest possible upsert operation, if you like, with merge under concurrency, and you're getting these violations. And in my view, at least for whatever we come up with initially, that's just not acceptable. So if you're using Oracle, say, and you want a, you want a merge that isn't atomic, well, apparently there is a way of doing this. Um, it might seem familiar to uh, members of the audience. Uh, so, so this is a, this is something I, I, I found on Stack Overflow. This is about a month ago, um, and someone here says, "Excellent! Finally, a concurrent uh, concurrent access is safe." Answer. So this person is proposing that you merge in a loop, very much like the loop we use. We're doing our insert update thing, which we always thought was a crude trick. Turns out you have to do it with Oracle's merge in order to get those semantics, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, so, so we were, we we kind of we always assumed that we this this would be completely unnecessary because merge was thought to just sort of do this for you, but in fact it doesn't. Um, with with any of the major implementations, certainly at least those two, um, and this is something I've, I've done a little bit of research on just to you know to better understand the trade-offs and so on. And it's clearly an evidence that uh, you know they don't they don't they simply don't fix the, they don't handle the, the major problems you know. Fair point. Um, so yeah, it, it just it what what we thought this does it doesn't do basically as far near as I can tell. Um, this is just probably the most salient example of this so. Um, I should point out this is a, this is the simplest possible upstart. There's no mystery to what what's going on here. You know, it's not like, it's not like I'm doing something. They're doing something weird with joining, and maybe, or maybe they've got duplicates on the join clause, which is undefined in by the standard. This is a simple simple upstart, and it still requires this loop. So, you know, that that might be useful for some things, but it's not useful for solving the basic problem of having some kind of upstart type thing and for OLTP mostly. Um, so, getting back to the trade-off, you pick any any two. Um, so, evidently, Postgres users they already like one and two, and they seem fine with zero risk of three. Certainly, I personally have heard no complaints. I'm willing to be corrected if anyone is better informed than I am. Kevin.
well. Um, the, what, I, don't, I don't understand what the tension is there. What do you? Um, can you give us your example of the feedback? Sure, sure. Can I just, if you wouldn't mind, I'll, I'll leave that till the end. Yeah, it's probably better to see that till the end. There's, there'll be time for questions. So getting back to the trade-off. So serializable use cases can uh, serializable isolation level can serve use cases where, you know, um, this is this is not acceptable. Um, and then maybe it is in theory possible to, if you like, square the circle, and get and get all three. Um, but I am skeptical. Um, it, I, I think it, it can only be done at great expense, and just basically isn't something that will ever be put into, into practice on a, in a serious database system. So I mention that only um, for completeness. Um, OK. Um, in summary, the implementation involves the intersection of some really complicated parts of the system. Um, the solutions proposed are clearly pragmatic trade-offs. I'm very comfortable with that. Um, and in fact, I don't think there's any alternative. And it's better in every way than the workaround proposed today, in particular in that it doesn't burn through transaction IDs. Um, but it is, the semantics are, are quite similar. Um, and they have problems with weak, uh, weak lock arbitration rules. Um, it doesn't appear to matter in practice. Um, I'm willing to be told that um, you know there might be cases where that isn't true, but um, it, it appears to be the case that I, I'm not aware of any complaints um, about this kind of thing occurring. And this is a plausibility argument, but that appears to be the name of the game here. Um, I, I think that it's probably likely that every major implementation is informed by these kinds of plausibility arguments and you know practical experience things like that. Um, so I'm you know being very upfront about that. That is the nature of this kind of thing. Um, now I think that's um, all I have on the slides. Um, I will go to questions. Uh, sure. Uh, yep. Yep. I was, I was afraid of that. <laughs> okay. Yep. Okay. Now, um, what is your sense about the need to check? Uh, I'm, I'm wondering uh, how to get a couple of things. I guess maybe it's the unique keys to use in both of those classes. Yes. Two separate unique keys to use in one unique key. Sure. And uh, the, the, there are fancy words that don't seem to be time checked that set up the kind of scenario. Right. Well, it would be that would be an unreasonable use of the feature. Uh, <laughs> no, the question is, what would it do? <laughs> well, it it would. Uh, well, I mean, it's not supposed to work that way. It's, it, it's implicit that you know what what it is. But okay, 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 okay. What would it do? Well, it would. Um, it would project a reject, which was accidentally whichever one happen to be rejected first. Um, now, you might think to uh, control for this by, uh, there's actually a feature that I haven't referred to before where, whereby it's possible to project the PID of the reject and not the rejector. Sorry, no, the, the, the rejector and not the reject, because of course the reject doesn't have a physical uh, uh, PID. So um, by that means, you could handle such complicated cases which would perhaps be compelling for the conflict resolution type use cases I referred to earlier. So if you're going to do that, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. You ought to know ahead of time where you're going to have your conflict. Well, let's say you don't. Well, then, you can, well, then you can do what I just said. You I can think that's the reason why I want to have the, uh, the, the type of scale implementation that protects that case and demonstrates, oh, you will have it by this solution. It's not helpful to make it but then, but, but in order to know what 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 was wrong, it's an, it's necessary to indicate explicitly what was intended, and in particular which in unique index was expected to be violated, I would suppose. Um, which is which um, which is problematic 
for, for various other reasons. And it's something that Robert um, did raise at one point. And I don't, I don't like that very much. What you're talking about, not you're not talking about idiomatic usage. So when I when I well, it depends on the order of execution. Um, you know, if the so rather arbitrarily, um, we insert in OID the find order into unique indexes. So that would be a factor for one. Um, so I suppose um, your, up, your update would, would be referencing something that was uh, potentially, if you like, the wrong, the wrong reject, or not, not a reject at all, rather, or not a rejector. Um, and so. Right, but that's not within the constraints that I defined, or at least meant to define, um, that would have you only expect this in the event of one unique index where the violation is clearly expected. But it must be an actual security violation. You have all the unique keys that are there to catch problems, actual data problems. With that, you will get errors that say, ooh, something happened. Well, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not uncommon to have one only one unique index on a table in the first place. Secondly, so you're saying you only well, want to support the one table with one unique index. No, I'm saying that. Sorry, go ahead, yeah. Um, I mean, there's other kinds of constraints as well. So let's just say, like, I mean, like, let's say, right? So I suppose some unreasonable would say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, this is not the exact thing that's unreasonable, but I'm not like I'm not sure it's reasonable in the first place. Well, well, it's it's there. There. Yeah, you can you can get it. You can say that you can only merge on one on one index, so that the other ones are just constraints that catch errors. But I'm not sure how to fix one index. Well, I suppose one way would be to have um, a predicate that you join on, connect rejoin, but um, from the source of an index. It, it also is well, it's even explicit as you might say, but it, yes, it certainly uh, you certainly could get um, unexpected behavior where that's happened, but I. I believe that that is something you get with other implementations as well. So I, I accept the, uh, the thrust of your point, but can only also point to the fact that you could um, anticipate this case and handle it as well, um, which is not the case with some of those other implementations. But the merge index has to go first, right? Yes. Yeah, so, well, the, you, you, the join. There, I think there are there are numerous restrictions on. Um, how in practice, if you've got a complicated predicate that you're joining on, it just doesn't work. I'm not quite sure of the details. Um, so any, any practical example, it'll almost always just be an equi join. Um, but um, I don't know too much about uh, how merge works in other systems. I merely thought it was interesting that, and perhaps illustrative of the trade-off I referred to, that um, you know, that they don't handle these, what you might consider to be race conditions. Right. Well, to be, fa to be fair, though, if, if the wrong thing was projected, then in fact you would update its, say, A column, as opposed to the actual intended. If it was the wrong, yes, there is an issue with it being the wrong constraint. Yes, that's true. Well, I, I guess, I guess, you, you are typically that way if you maximize errors. Mm -hmm. So you set a duplicate for the error if you have an error in the wrong data. I d well, for one thing, I don't. I mean, well, you, what you're saying is correct. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying it isn't, um, and it certainly could be a concern. Um, what I, I can only point to. Um, a number of other implementations that have similar issues. 
Um, and at least I can detect that case here. Well, the updates, that, well, that's, well, that's true as well, yes. The update could get it. That's a separate issue. Yeah, but let's say that the receiver is the kind of thing that's going to hide it. Um, we can well, that, that, that shouldn't happen. That's, that's part of the deal. Well, it can. Um, well, no, it shouldn't. The structure of this is a business scheme, right? And the one that's actually taking the information <laughs> is actually going to be that person that we call the agent. Right. No, so then Well, that would be one. I'm being told to. I think if you, regardless of whether or not you, you're handling it, I think if you have potentially multiple conflicts and you're handling them in line in a DML statement, that could get very messy very quickly. And I would suggest if that was your use case, you would have some kind of ad hoc handling of that. Uh, yes, sir. I can't say I've given that any thought. I, I really don't know. And it, it, it is, yes. Um, I think it's probably something I'm going to uh, iterate on again. Um, I did solicit feedback on it, and um, I actually didn't get very much feedback on it at all. I specifically solicited feedback on, on a thread on hackers and uh, didn't hear back too much. So I don't want to suggest that that's uh, implicit approval, uh, but so anyway, I'm, I'm done. Uh, if no one has any questions.